So I'm going to now, uh, so I've got this material applied. I've named it after the mesh. Um, so that's what's going to show up inside of Painter as the name of my material. Now, again, that name is, uh, it's not really super important that you do that now. Uh, you can always go rename the material inside of Painter. And a lot of times I, I forego this and just put a material on. But I do want to make sure that the entirety of the mesh has one material on it. And that's so that when I get into Painter, when I start painting this thing, I, Painter doesn't get multiple materials on things. Um, so it would have me think that, you know, something is separate. So we're going to get into doing UVs here. And uh, I will UV this mesh, and then I will, uh, and I now will bring it into Painter. So that's kind of the second step here that we need. So the modeling is done. We need need to now unwrap this object so that we can we can actually project textures onto it. And then, um, no, no, you do not need to create a separate uh, material for your plastic bits. Again, there are there are bits of plastic on this. You know, the uh, the Picatinny rail and its mount here would be plastic. The uh, the grips here would be plastic. I'm not I'm not going to separate that out. Um, there are some texturing techniques. There are some asset creation techniques that that is a thing where people will separate uh, their their asset based off what the materials are. Um, but we're only doing a single texture on this, and so we're gonna we'll actually let painter um, make things look like plastic and metal. So it's going to be a real easy thing to do. So to get into doing UVs here, I've got the entirety of the asset selected, okay? This is all of the components. And I want to do this because I actually want to unwrap them all together. The unwrapping tools are the green ones situated at the top of the toolbar. And I'm going to first start by the one third from the right. This is the open UV editor. When I do that, we're going to see the hot mess that is my pistol. Uh, and this hot mess is uh, is expected. Um, this is kind of what happens when you when you model things in 3D. The act of creating UVs or uh, creating um, uh, extrusions and connecting edges and, and things like that. When you manipulate your object in 3D, it does manipulate it in 2D as well. So don't be alarmed when you open up your model if the first thing you see is a is a big old mess of of nonsense that's okay we're going to clean this up really really quickly now in terms of visually what you're seeing we have two colors of edges that have appeared on the model we have white ones and we have green ones the difference between these two colors is whether or not they are welded together inside of the uv editor so the green edges that you see are edges that are welded together and the white edges are edges that are actually broken apart so you can see right now on this model that the majority of it is actually broken apart and so what i'm going to do i'm going to go to face mode or polygon mode and i'm going to select the entirety of my weapon i want to make sure that i've got all of it selected here um so i'm just going to go once around make sure that i don't have back face calling on so that i do get the whole weapon and then with that on, I'm just going to click the very first button here. This is a planar projection. So when I do that, we should actually see the pistol in its side view. More importantly, we should actually see that most of the white has now disappeared. Now, it won't be all of the white. Wherever your mesh contains a hole, you're going to see that some white remains. <clears throat> this, is, this is good for a couple of reasons. First, it allows you to identify errors. Right now, I can see that in this mesh, there is an error. This error is somewhere in this back region here. I can see that all of these edges are white. Now, when you do a planar projection, the only reason that these things become open is if they're open in 3D. So I'm going to go to my vertices, and I'm going to go and select, and I can see that, in fact, there are four vertices right where this one point is. And so that's going to be something that I really need to do. Yeah, you, you can do a box projection as well. Um, there's there's nothing different between the box and the uh, in the planer other than just what the end results are. But since I kind of go through the whole thing with a with a fine tooth uh, comb here, I'm not going to just box map it and and relax it or what have you, um, because there's some things that I can weld together that a box map will break. So uh, for instance, the the back of the grip here, I can actually have all of these faces through here connected to all of these faces and a box map will actually break that and so you know i i can do that kind of thing 
Um, but anyway, what I'm interested in here first is to correct the errors. So I'm just going to go through here and I'm going to go to mesh, um, edit mesh and merge. And I'm just going to make sure I'm actually watching the number here. It did drop down, uh, which is good. I'm going to get out of isolation mode back in a polygon mode and I will do another planar projection. And I can see that that had the effect that I was after. It actually did break, um, those white lines up. I can see that there is still more here broken, which does not appear to be on this piece. So that's good. We'll get out of here. And then it looks like it might be on this piece. So if I go and select all of this and do a planar map, no, that piece looks pretty good too. So I am seeing, there it is. There's still a white line here. So if I go to vertex mode, aha, there is a single vertex that got left behind. So that is a modeling error that I can go and clean up quite easily. So again, I'll isolate everything here. Uh, you don't have to be too granular with this. When you do this, um, it will it will very much uh, be something that kind of pops up as we go um, that you'll be able to see these errors. So again, I ended up with an error there even though I cleaned that thing up. Once you start unwrapping this stuff, you will find that uh, the errors kind of, they show up to you. Yes, your attachments are going to be, uh, they're going to need to be different, um, right? Because, and, and the reason for this is that we want to make sure that we're, we're being optimized in the engine. And so what I mean by that is that we want to make sure that when we load something, um, an asset, you know, a texture has to sit in memory in your game engine. Um, you want to make sure that that is going to be something that, uh, is only in memory if it needs to be. So if you think of having your, uh, let's say, um, let's say, uh, Lev, you have a, a weapon and, uh, and your weapon, I can see I've got some end guns here that are creating holes as well. I think we're going to be okay with that hole, actually. Uh, so let's say, Lev, that your weapon is a is a shotgun, just out of random, uh, and uh, and you have a suppressor on it, because that makes a lot of sense. And then somebody else makes an AK-47, and theirs is a, is a uh, muzzle brake. Well, if you keep your entire shotgun and the attachment into a single texture, it means that it has to load the entire texture of your shotgun just to apply the suppressor to a different weapon. Whereas if you were to make a smaller texture for the smaller attachment, then you only need to load the pixels from that smaller texture into memory uh, in order to make sure that you, uh, you, you aren't kind of really killing your resources, right? So you're only kind of loading textures for what you need. Um, so that if somebody applies the, you know, the suppressor you made, you don't get all of the, all of the, the shotgun stuff loaded up. And so that's kind of important. Okay. So now that I uh, I kind of have this here um, kind of planar mapped in a way that I'm I'm pleased with, uh, it's now going to be going in and and kind of separating the chunks and really doing uh, a thorough job of unwrapping this. So some of these things are going to be pretty easy to unwrap. Case in point, the uh, the hand grips here. So I'm going to move the pistol out of the way. I will grab the hand grips and I will move them back. Now, one of the things that makes um, the UVs inside of Maya such a joy to work with compared to other 3D packages is the fact that I can also manipulate the geometry while I go. So to show you what I mean here, I'm gonna grab just the hand grips and I'm gonna isolate them. And I know that on the one side where the cutaway is, it's hollow in the back, which is good, that's what I want. But on the other one, it's not. I actually left it completely open. This is causing a lot of triangles to be created here, triangles that we're not going to see because they're going to end up inside the pistol. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down and select all of these faces, and I'm doing this in 3D. You can see them being selected here in 2D as well. Now, this would be a separate UV island. I would actually have a seam go around here. But because none of these faces are selected, and there's 22 of them, I can actually just hit Delete. And that's going to give me a much better... Um, uh, polygon count. It's going to lower my polygon count, and I could probably use those those faces in a place that uh, you know is is more worth having. 
Um, I can make something a little bit rounder or what have you. And so I'm going to go out of isolation mode. I'm going to select the whole pistol again. And this is one of the really nice things about working in Maya. We can actually make modeling changes here as we go. So with that, I have these two things selected. Now, the planar projection here is probably all I need with this. I'm just going to open up the unfold. So this is the UV toolkit here. And if you go into modify and unfold options, we get the options for the unfolder and we have unfold 3D, the new plugin that Autodesk has acquired and, and brought into Maya. And we have the legacy version. So we can actually drop down to the old version that Maya used as well. I'm going to use the unfold 3D. It is a much better version of this. Uh, I'm going to let it not fix my non-manifold geometry. I usually turn this off. Um, the only reason I'm okay with having it on right now is that I actually did go into mesh cleanup and told it to clean my model already. So this shouldn't actually change anything. We have iteration. So the number of times it's going to attempt to unfold your geometry. I'm okay with one. And then we also have our map size. This is a uh, interpretation of, of how big you plan on having your texture. I also don't really need to worry about that. So when I hit apply, these two meshes, you're going to see them kind of... Uh, soften a little bit and what they're doing is they're trying to get as close to the shape um, of the 3d object as they can so i'm just going to move and rotate these things so what this is doing is it's kind of just flattening them out so you can see up at the top here i've got a really thin polygon and this corresponds to the very top of the grip where i have this really thin polygon now the more seams you add to a uv island the more expensive the mesh is in a 3D engine. And the reason for that is that your vertex count changes. So right now, the number of vertices on this grip, on this UV island, are the same as the number of vertices in 3D. But if I were to go make a cut, say along these two edges and these two edges, and I'll do the same at the bottom here, I'm just grabbing the edges where it's a little bit on an angle. And if I were to break those, I'm gonna go to Cut, so, cut. You can see the shortcut for this is Shift X. So I'm going to use that from now on. So that will break those. You can see they're now white. And if I re-unwrap this piece again, you'll see the shape changes. And it's gonna give me a little bit more. You can see that it's not much. It just kind of opened up a little bit. Um, it's gonna give me a little bit more. Now, the, the, the reason I'm doing this is to show you that now, what used to be a single vertex is now two vertices. This means that there are now two numbers that the software will have to track in 3D space. Now, UVs, for those of you who didn't know this, is a um, uh, where, that, where that terminology comes from, why they're called UVs, um, is that it's just another set of three-dimensional space, another, uh, another 3D space that your mesh exists in. Your modeling exists in X, Y, and Z. And UVs are actually just another 3D space over here called UVW, which are just the next three letters going backwards. So this is 2D space. And the reason that it's 2D space, but actually 3D space, is that we just make zero for W. So we just always make that planar, and that gives us 2D space. So that's why they're called UVs. It's actually just the next three letters in the alphabet going backwards and and we see them now in this way so i'm going to leave these like this this looks pretty good here i do want to try and straighten them out a little bit um this is something that's really important to understand as well i'm going to open up the arrange and layout and i'm going to hit orient to edges and that's just going to make that edge that i have selected straight now the reason you want your uvs to be as straight as possible is that your textures only contain pixels and pixels are going to be square. So when I have something like this grip on an angle, I'm going to get stepping as the pixels try to go down that angle. In fact, you can see this happening even just with the software drawing this edge, you can see the little bit of stepping that it does on an angle. So ideally, the more edges you have that are straight, like this, the better your mesh is going to get textured. You're actually just going to have a little bit of a cleaner texture. Cool. So those two pieces I can call done. I'm going to move them out of the zero to one box, just over to the side. 
and I will leave the spot empty for the next mesh that I need. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that point, Lev, once, once I get the, the rest of this guy done here. So next, I'll grab the, uh, the body of the weapon here. I'm not doing this in any, any particular order. I'm just trying to grab, uh, just grab pieces here as they, as they come up. And so I'm going to go into edge mode and we can start to select where we want our edges to go. So this one, I'm going to go and follow the, uh, I've got a hard edge here on my model. And a hard edge is a really good uh, good place to go and decide to place your seams upon. Um, and so I'm going to go across here. And that's not where I wanted that. Let's go and see. Let me go and isolate this mesh here as well. I'm using Control-1 to isolate a mesh. And that's going to make it just a little bit easier here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and make this uh, planar as it were. So I'm going to take, you can see that this is actually a really flat face here, which means it should unwrap really nice and clean. And uh, I'm going to go and just cut around here. And I'll include that as well. And we'll come back down the other side, around here. And uh, I believe I can leave that as well. So we're going to hit Shift X, which will cut that. I can see it's now turned white, indicating to me that it has been cut. And I will follow the same pattern on the other side here. This mesh is actually symmetrical, so I'm going to turn on my symmetry here in a minute, which is going to uh, make my life a little bit simpler. So I'm going to go to Symmetry and Object X. And then I can more quickly select my edges. Uh, I'm going to cut this back plate off. Again, I can see that there are hard edges going all the way around it, so that's a really good place to be able to go and split those. We shall follow the hard edge up the front of the weapon. Like so. Now, uh, I'm gonna just to here, I don't need to go any further. And then we can go up this way. Actually, I think that one's going to be okay like that. I am just going to split this edge here and this edge here. And uh, I should now have, if I go and double click on this here, we should be able to separate this. It is not separate, so something is still well done. I can see the back plate is, is empty now. Uh, there's something that is still connected. Oh, it's right there. Let's make sure that's not the case here. That is not the case. So if I go into this here now and select that, you can see I can get the the bottom section of this. And then these two plates now are kind of going to be independent of one another. Uh, at least they're supposed to be. They're still connected somewhere. You can see as I move it, I get stretching, uh, which is an indication that something is still connected somewhere. I don't actually see anything connected. So I'm just going to do a planar map on this, and that will separate it for me. We can go select this and this, and I think I'm pretty good. The only other thing that I want to do is that I, I really don't like when I get UVs that have a hole in it, like a donut, something like this. Um, that to me is going to cause a problem. So I'm going to give it another edge right here that I'm going to split. And that should allow it to actually unwrap a little bit cleaner. So there are now kind of the islands that I want, at least uh, from the start here, what I can kind of predict what I'm going to want. This one I'm going to split as well. And I'll go to my faces, I'll go to uh, unfold, and we'll see what this is able to achieve for us. Now, it has made a little tiny island out of this one, right? They're the wrong size compared to everything else. Uh, I can also see that the internal workings of this, this did not work as anywhere near as well as I would have liked. So this is an area here where I can go and split this up as well, giving me, I'm hoping, a little bit of a cleaner break here. So I'll unfold that. And indeed, that did a much better job. I may even go into the front here and split that front piece up. So if I go into my edges, I can see that right here is where I would need to break that. And this should be two islands now. This one becoming a lot cleaner. And this one, let's see, this and this should still be welded. So when you have something that is broken that you need connected again, under cut and sew, you can use sew, and that'll connect them together again. 
if you were going in, you were selecting an edge like this, and I can see where it's supposed to be welded, and it's not selecting the counterpart, that tells me that there's actually an error in here, uh, in that the mesh is actually broken where it should not be. So for instance, I can select right here, where it's telling me that this should be one vertex, but in 3D, it's telling me there are three. And so that is a place where that needs to be merged together. It's now telling me that there are two vertices, which is a little bit of a better predicament. I will go to my edges here and we'll check and see that can now actually be welded. So that's a good sign. Whoops. Not sure why that is doing that, but let's go and select this whole thing and try and put a uh, box map on it. I'm going to use box map here so that it gives me a, uh, a better projection on this thing. And again, so I can see that it is indeed breaking at some point. So it means that I have, again, multiple vertices where there should only be one. So there and there. It's actually telling me that there is uh, four vertices here. So this is one of the things that uh, that you'll find while you're doing your textures is that you are going to come across errors in the geometry um, that just kind of happen. It's telling me there are nine vertices here. Okay, so that's probably a good indication here that I've messed something up. Nope, it still looks like just one. That's a lot of vertices to have in one place. Um, mesh merge and down to two so i just want to get this as clean as i can i'm going to go into vertices here let's just give the whole darn thing a weld so i'm at 490 edit mesh merge and i'm at 475 now so that's a good indication that i've found a few more places where things have been broken I'll try my box map on this again and there now it's actually doing what i wanted it to do which is giving me a really nice clean shape. And those seams are now gone. This is an internal piece. We're not actually going to see this on the pistol at all, except for when the uh, the slide is removed, which is not something that can happen. Um, this piece, so this is the internal piece here. I'm going to, let's start straightening some of these pieces. So this one's already pretty straight. I'll go grab a center edge, and I will orient that to the edge. I'll grab a center edge here, and I'll orient that to the edge. Now this piece, again diagonal or crooked edges tend to be a little bit um, of something you don't want. Now, this one isn't too bad because they occur at the back here where I won't see this, but at the front, you can see that they have a little bit of a stepping. And so I'm going to straighten that out. And all that's going to do is it's going to give me a cleaner line in my texture here. It's introducing a little bit of distortion, but I'm okay with that distortion um, because it's going to uh, it's going to give me a cleaner shape. So something's gone horribly wrong with this football. There we go. That's a little bit better. Um, this is the uh, all of the underside here. And uh, and it's actually gone a little bit haywire in that I can see there's a, a loop that's not being cut. Uh, I'm also going to break this even further. I'm going to remove the bottom from here. And I will take that bottom out. We can unfold the bottom. We'll try and unfold this. This is obviously where the trigger guard is. This one should become a lot cleaner. And we can go straighten that out. So we'll grab, again, an edge somewhere in the middle, straighten it. This one, too, um, I could probably go and make this a little bit better. Uh, if I go and hit my straighten UVs, um, it should try and make this thing a lot straighter, which will uh, give me, again, a cleaner texture on the back. Now, this is actually somewhere where, in a first-person shooter, you would definitely want to have that really clean. I know the hand is going to cover some of this, but a really nice texture seam there would be good to have uh this one's okay we're gonna go and straighten it as well orient to edge we'll grab this one and again there's a break somewhere that's going to need to happen here um which i'll just put right around the center of this hole and then we'll try and unwrap this again and there that's a little bit better we'll grab a center edge and we'll orient that and that's now good uh, what the heck has happened here? So it would appear as though this piece has rebroken itself, uh, which is an indication of a further problem with the geometry. Um, so to show you what I mean, 
where I had nine vertices earlier, if I go and select in here, it's going to tell me that there are eight now. Um, and so it has absolutely gone and broken this model further. So uh, I'm at 47. It's increased my uh, vert count. And so I'm going to merge that back down. And we'll grab all of this. And I'll box map it again, which should give me the right effect, the right look. And there we go. Now, these are not... Um, these are not uh, sharing a proper text textile density, right? This little tiny piece here, which is the inside of the slide, is small on the mesh, but big in the UVs. All of the other components are kind of backwards. They're all kind of all over the place in terms of their resolution. And that's okay. That's kind of to be expected. Let's see, what is this? Can I unfold that? So something is not working well in here. I'm going to turn off my symmetry. And it looks like these things are actually okay. They've already been unwrapped, so I don't actually need to do anything with those. They were just overlapping. So we'll bring those over here. They're actually pretty straight too. We'll zoom in on this guy. We'll straighten this guy. Grab an edge and center it. Ooh, that's not straight at all. Let's see if we can't do a better job on this. There we go. Edges orient to that, and that one's going to be nice and straight. And then lastly are these two pieces here, which I will orient as well. And then I move this aside. I can see that this one's got some errors. Um, there is some some weirdness going on with this vertex, which for whatever reason is not in the right place, and these two vertices, which are definitely not in the right place. So something is a miss here. And it looks like it's got to do with some of these faces. So let's try a planar projection on this. There we go there. And that is actually the right shape that it should have. This one too, I'm gonna to do a planar projection on and bring it over here. And I wanna get these things so that they're not flipped. This is gonna make doing uh, text a little bit easier. So the one that I currently have selected is the one that's over here. Okay, so that's that side. And this one is actually on the other side. So this one is mirrored. So I'm gonna to wanna to flip this over. So I'm gonna to go to my transformations. I'm gonna go find, there's rotate, um, there's distribution, all kinds of things here. I'm gonna flip this in U, which will flip it the right way. Okay, and now those guys are all good to go. So we can go back into our layout and lay them out. And layout, when you use this button, it's going to reorganize them inside of the zero to one box. And more importantly, it's going to make their, um, it's going to make their tile density match. Now, this did break that piece again. This means that there is actually something really wrong with this mesh that needs to be corrected. There's something in the geometry and the way that it was modeled that is forcing this thing to break apart in the UVs every time it gets unwrapped. And so this is this is a problem that needs to be solved. You can see that that vert count is back up to seven again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and clean up the geometry. I'm gonna try and get rid of edges that I don't need. In the case of uh, that edge, that didn't need to be there. You can also see I have a vertex in the middle of this, which really doesn't need to be there either. So I'm gonna go to target weld and I'll move that out of the way like that. We'll go to edges and this is a quad down here. So that edge is no longer needed. And that actually looks a lot cleaner now. We'll see if that helps the topology out. We'll go and select all these newer cleaner faces and I will again box map them. The box mapping has again indicated that there is an error by the fact that a edge is split. Going into my vertices, there are six vertices here. If I were to go and merge this, we do get down to one. I will grab those faces again. We will box map them again. And again, we're nice and clean. If I hit layout, ah, it's telling me there's non-manifold geometry, um, which means geometry that cannot exist. If we were to 3D print this, it wouldn't work. There would actually be an error in the geometry. So what I want to do is try and identify where that error is. I need to fix this because it's going to cause problems down the road. So this piece looks just fine. My my guess is that there's actually another face 
in here that we can't see. Um, and so I'm going to try by uh, selecting that corner and removing the faces that I can click on. And indeed, there's no error in there. Uh, there's an, there's an edge that doesn't need to exist. So again, I have an edge kind of going sideways here, which has no business being in here. And that's now even further clean. We'll grab this. I'm going to box map it again to make sure that again, it is staying solid. We'll grab all of this and I'll hit layout. And again, we have non-manifold geometry. Now, if you can't find the non-manifold geometry, you can try to fix it. But often what that fix is going to do is it's actually going to break the geometry. So I'm going to go to clean up and I'm going to say instead of clean up, select it and apply. And what this is going to do is it's going to show me where my non-manifold geometry is. So uh, I'll turn off lamina faces. It's not actually indicating that there is anything. So the non-manifold must be in the uh, the UVs. Uh, everything looks okay to me. That piece is clean. Let's try just doing a layout on this one. And that is the one where the non-manifold exists. So I'm going to use the fix on this and move it apart. And we can see again, the issue going on is that it is breaking this geometry. So. In a situation like this, where I can't find the error, I don't know what's going on with the error, I'm going to delete those polygons. Then I will go rebuild them. Let's do this in symmetry so we can do this twice as fast. I'm just going to go rebuild them here. So I will bridge here. Uh, where did bridge go? Bridge, 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 there. Bridge. Okay, and then I will bridge here. Aha. Uh -huh. So this one did not bridge, it gave me an error. That means that somewhere in here, again, we have the wrong number of vertices. And again, it's in this spot. Telling me there are two here. So if I go and move one of these things, that looks okay. I go into edges, there's one edge there. There are two edges there. That's to be expected, again, I do have holes in here. So maybe what I'll need to do is I'll need to clean that up by having those go across. So you can see I have big end gones here in my low poly. That means that there's a hole here and that's probably what's causing the entire thing to break. So I'll go fix that. So the fix is going to be going to vertices and I will start with the uh, multi-cut and I can go from center. I try to go from center. Up like this. And you can see where I'm going to just join these things together here. And what I'm doing is just trying to correct the fact that there's an open hole here. So that hole is not allowing for the geometry to weld together in the way that I'd like it to. I'm going to turn off the symmetry so that I can connect these things across. Now I did this in the high poly and I figured it would be okay if it was a hole in the low poly uh, because I'd be able to uh, make that work, uh, but in the end, it didn't think so. So uh, it would appear as though I've missed one. And go do this again. Multi-cut with symmetry. And we'll go up here. Okay, now we can kill the symmetry. And I can go back and cut across here. So now what I need to do is just weld all of my newfound vertices together. I'll just go and select them all, edit mesh merge. And I've gone from 36 to 26, which is a good sign. I want to make sure that there are six, four, and three. Aha. So there is an error in here still. Let's go and take a look at this. And you can see that indeed this is a little too far off the mark. So I can do that one, that one. And that should give us the right amount, which means now when I go and weld this hole together at the back here, this should be a permanent fix. So now we can try uh, to continue bridging and see if it allows us to. So bridge, 
Uh, I did one side. Let's see if this side works. It does. We'll go through here. I'm actually going to just close this hole. And then I'll do some connecting in here. So this one's going to connect here. This one's going to connect here. I'll connect there. Let's switch over to multi-cut because this will be faster. And then uh, I've got an end gone here. So we'll go and clean that up. And there. My new found faces should now be manifold and should now work. So I do a planar projection. That seems to be okay. I can see that there's uh, some faces here. These guys here. That their, uh, their UVs got broken a little bit. So I'm going to go and grab these. And I will just do a planar projection on this. I'm going to... That's odd. Ah. Too much selection. Okay. So we'll do a little planar projection on here. And uh, I will grab the little red handle. The rotation tool. And I'm going to rotate this in a way that allows me to relax this a little bit better. There's that piece, which I will unfold and straighten. And then there is but one more piece here. These two things will unfold and we'll straighten. Okay, this piece should now finally work. So I hit layout. I don't get the non-manifold error and it now has placed all of this all to scale. I've got perfect texel density um, and I can get out of this piece and hopefully run into fewer errors along the way. So I'm going to select all of this and again the hand grips are done. I'm going to also consider now the main body done. I'll move it over here too. So again this is my workspace and these are the ones that are complete. And so I just kind of need to keep going through this in that way, selecting little bits and pieces of things and unwrapping it as, uh, as I need. So these two little guys, they can be next. They're really quick and simple to unwrap. These are toruses, and they're only half toruses, so I can put a center edge through there. I'm just going to make sure I get this one in the right spot. I want it on the inside where it'll be not as noticeable. I can take these two things, unfold them, Again, all of these round curvy shapes are not going to be as friendly to UVs as would um, straighter edges. Uh, I can also see that on this one, one of my edges got moved. And so I'm going to move this back up. I accidentally shifted it. Um, we're going to re-unfold that piece now that the UVs are correct. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to grab all of this and I'm going to hit straighten UVs to try and make them angular, optimize, straighten. If you don't get a perfect rectangle, you can bounce back and forth between optimization and straightening, or you can shift over to your UV vertices, and then you can just go scale them till they're straight. Oops, making sure I only select the ones I want. And there, those guys are good to go. I'm not gonna bother, bother packing those. I'm just gonna move them over here. And we'll move on to the next piece. So that's that's those three pieces done. Here is the magazine magazine release button. Unfold. So this one is not unfolding. This indicates to me that I have an issue with this. That issue is that there are faces in the back which don't need to exist. So we'll remove our selection from the front and sides. There's the back. I'll delete that. Now, if I unfold this, I get a perfect unfold. We can bring everything else back. And this guy is now good. Move him over here. We have the trigger, which I'll pull over here. The trigger, too, I know right out of the gate has some topology that isn't needed at the back. So I will remove all of the front. There's just the back. I can delete that. We can't see inside the weapon. And so we don't need that. I'll grab the two edges at the bottom and the two edges at the top. And these two edges. And I'll break those. Which will allow for this thing to open up really nice and clean. Or cleaner. 
we'll uh, we'll rotate this around, try and get it pretty straight here. Might be able to get it a little cleaner yet if I break this edge. Unfold. It's a little cleaner. Um, what I also could do if I if I was okay with it would be to just split this like this, which will give me less distortion in the sides of this thing. And then we can go straighten this. So we'll go to edges, top, 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 straighten. And those pieces are done. So we'll move those into the collection of done ones. We'll move on to the next piece. Here's the hammer. We'll uh, exit isolation. We'll go back to the hammer. I'll isolate it. This one's going to be pretty easy. I'm actually just going to get each side on its own. So what I'm going to do, here's my zero to one. I'm going to box map this. That's going to give me close to what I want. What I actually want is just to separate these two out. This stuff, I can actually go and make one full um, break. So I'm going to do a planar projection. And I'm going to rotate it just so that I get a skewed perspective on it. I'm just going to make sure that the tool works. And then I'm going to go and break a couple of these edges. And I'll break them uh, separating the front here from the back. And then what this should do when I unfold it is give me a perfectly straight rectangle which is just kind of going all the way around. So that'll give me a much better break on that. So we'll go and move these into the collection of completed. We have the magazine, which I'll isolate here as well. We're going to go in and break around the bottom plate. We'll break around the top cap. We'll break around the bottom. I can see there's some uh, funky edges going on down here. So let's undo this and figure out why this went wrong on us. So I'm going to go and it looks like I had just left an end gone down here. And uh, the software decided to clean it for me by triangulating it, which doesn't need to exist. And so I'll go back into edges here. And we'll go around and we'll break that. Now I just need to choose one edge uh, to split the whole thing, and I'm gonna choose the edge on the right. Now the reason I'm choosing the edge on the right is just that when we see this thing in a third person view is, you know, the gun's invisible right now, we can't see the gun. But when the magazine gets pulled out, that's probably the best place to have the seam. And so I'll split that. If I now go into all of this and unfold, we can see what we end up with here. I am gonna do a a uh, an unwrap of this. Uh, that's not what I wanted at all. So I'm gonna make sure when I do this that it doesn't select the previous piece again, which it had. It had the hammer there. So there, we can go do this. I'll bring this back, and I can see that the uh, the magazine actually has a bottom, which needed to be cut as well, and it was not. So I'll go and edit that. Oh, did you have scaling turned off? Yeah, that should be there by default. Uh, you should not have um, scaling turned on. Let me go through those settings. That is in the layout settings. So the reason that I'm getting um, these things to be texel density perfect here as I do this is that the setting that I'm using in the, uh, in the unfold is making it do so. I'm just gonna split this off. And these guys should work. So let me hit unfold, which will clean this up. We'll straighten these things, and then I'll show you what that setting is. So we'll straighten this, 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 and this, and orient to edges, which is good. And then just like I did with everything else, I'm going to straighten these two. Again, it's going to give me a little bit of a letter, a better layout. And we'll go place this here. So when I hit the layout button, if I go to modify, layout, and options. Inside of here, you can choose what it does when it does the layout. Now, the reason I hadn't gone over this yet is that I'm just doing kind of these uh, these these layouts that are temporary. Once the whole gun is unwrapped like this, I will lay out everything together. And so if I go through here, uh, one of the things that you can do is preserve 3D ratios in your shell, your shell prescaling. 
And what this does is it lines up the UVs to match the scaling in the 3D world. So big objects get big shells, little objects in 3D get little shells in 2D. And so that's what setting is, is doing that. Now, whenever you have this, op this options open and you hit apply, the layout button now uses these settings. And so that's, that's what's going to fix that for you. Uh, let's go into the Picatinny rail. We'll get out of here. We'll bring this up this way. So I've got three chunks of Picatinny on this thing, which I will bring up and uh, <clears throat> isolate. So I'm going to try and separate these in a way that is going to make it uh, easiest to unwrap, which is to just separate them top and bottom. So I'm going all the way around the halfway point here. Uh, with a lot of little uh, cuts in an object like this, up and down, uh, it can be really, really, really hard to not end up with a ton of UV islands if you try to automate this. So I'm going to split them like this. And split. And I will do this one as well, all the way around this center line here. And what that'll do is it'll give me one big chunk for the bottom, which is just fine. And it'll give me one big chunk for the top, which is fine. I am going to have to cut two more edges in the top to make it work. But let me do this first and I'll show you, I'm gonna get a clean one and a broken one. Actually, I'll have to do a new edge for the bottom as well. So there, so we just split them in, in two. And if I now use this as an unfold, you'll see that we kind of get most of the way there. They're just a little, uh, a little blobby. You see, they're they're really nicely unwrapped, but there there's a little bit of blobbing going on on them. Let me just go lay them out, and we can do this in the uh, the proper scaling here. So to fix that blobbing, what I need to do is break the corners, like so, and that should. Not you just go into the four corners here where these picture frame areas are. And that should actually allow it to break a little bit cleaner. Now the tops are going to need a little bit more than this. But the bottoms will be perfect. We'll break those. And you can see I'm doing them all at once here because it's a little bit faster. So you can see these guys are now actually really good. So those unwrapped really, really nice. You can see the top ones, however, are still a little bit broken. And that's because... I need to do that all the way along. Each Picatinny rail needs to have those little segments broken. And that's gonna allow it to open up a little bit further and give me straighter edges, which again is gonna result in cleaner textures. Now, your normal maps, when I'm talking about cleaner textures, I talked about the fact that Substance Painter can correct mistakes. Right, if you make mistakes in your UVs, you get distortion in your UVs. Substance Painter can correct some of that by, you know, adding distortion to your textures, which you know, two negatives kind of become a positive, where the distortion in the UVs and the distortion in the textures kind of cancel out in your texture. However, this won't happen in your bakes. So when you do bakes like this, if you have warbles in your UVs, Substance Painter can't correct that. So if you go look at this now. These are all really nice and straight here. So we'll go and line these up. I'm just grabbing the center edge on each, orient to edge. Uh, I've got one sideways here. I'll double click him, transform and rotate. And these are now in the done section. We'll move them over here. And so the idea is to try and get uh, as clean a UV as you can um, in terms of where your seams are and such so that you can place things correctly. So we're going to unwrap this guy. Again, I've got a few edges here that I know can be split on this. We'll see if that helps it at all. Which one did I use? I used that one. And we'll see how well this unwraps. There we go. A little bit better. And see there's a little bit of wobbling in here. I'm going to use the optimize tool. And just make my brush a little bit bigger here. Yeah, that's worse. I'll unfold it again. And we're going to go with that. I know there's some distortion in it, but uh, I think it's going to be okay. So this piece here has got distortion around it there. 
we'll leave it. I want to move forward here and actually get into Painter. So this can come over here. We've got this guy, which is the slide lock. Again, I'll move it out of the way. Let me grab these uh, these buttons here too. These are going to be some, not that one, these guys. These two are going to be pretty quick to unwrap. Again, I've got faces on the back here that needn't be there. And so I will select those, this, and delete. And then these things can be unfolded. And now add it over here. I have the slide lock, which again, I will remove the back of it. This one, I'm not actually going to delete the back, uh, just in case it is a little bit more visible. So I'm going to keep it on there, but we will separate it in the UV islands. We'll unfold those, move this one aside. And again, I'm going to add a couple of breaks in it here to try and clean up the UVs a little bit better in the corners. Missed one. We'll see if that's any better. A little bit better. We'll straighten these out. And then we can grab this and put them over here. We've got the iron sight at the back. This one's pretty easy. It's just a couple of boxes. So I'm going to split them off so that I have the back plate, the front plate, the bottom box, and so on. So I'll move this up here and I'll unfold it. It's going to give me a, uh, eh, it's not unfolding. Okay. Let's go in. Oh, that means it's got a bottom face on it. So we'll go and remove that. Uh, can I see that bottom face from any angle? I can. It's visible from here. So that means I need to keep it. Uh, so that's fine. We'll do a box map on this. And call that done. Actually, we're gonna go and uh, we're gonna go and weld these edges together. And I'll straighten that. Move that over here. Let's go to our UV vertices and just line this up a little bit better. Again, there's a couple of edges here. I'll just get them a little bit straighter in the software. I'll take care of the rest. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm okay with that. I'll move this over here. What else have we got? There's the slide. We've got the casing, uh, the barrel. Oh, and my barrel. I didn't high poly the barrel properly. I ignored the barrel. Might have to come back to that. It'll uh, cause me an error when I bake. So let's go and split these fins off the back by breaking that. Um, we're going to split the back off so that it's its own mesh here as well. We'll go around here. So that should give me the ability of popping that off. It did not. Oh, on the bottom. It's this one. Still connected somewhere. Right there. There we are. So we'll do a cursory unwrap of this. I can see my edges here where they need to be broken. And this one. And this piece should now unwrap a lot cleaner. And I'll put a break in here too. We'll see if that doesn't help this thing along. This should. I'm really confused why this is not unfolding any better. It's it's planar. So it should just give me a really clean shape. Since it's not, I will just force it to be planar. Uh, 
That's very bizarre. There we go. That's better. Here, orient to edge, orient to edge. Uh, we've got the barrel now, which I'm going to split the front off of. And I'm going to give the front an edge in the center here too. So this is part of, again, making things, uh, making things straight. There's the outer barrel, the inner barrel, and the front. So if I unfold the front here, what this should give us, you can see it's doing a really good job of, uh, of staying circular here because it is really planar like that. Um, but I would like this to be uh, a straight rectangle. It's going to give me better a better shape that way. So because of that, I have to kind of go and uh, enforce it a little bit. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to rotate it this way and move it over here. And we'll take the whole thing and move it up out of the way so I don't interfere with anything else. And I'll take the bottom quarter from this side, and we'll rotate it and move it over here this way. And I'll take these two and rotate them, these two, and rotate them this way. I'm just trying to get this a little bit straighter. If I can, just kind of help it along a little bit. Now that I've kind of done that, if I uh, straighten this, it'll get a little bit better. Uh, we're going to go into vertices here, and I'll just go and move this. And get it somewhat rectangular. Again, the software can take over once I've got the whole thing close enough. And something like that. I just want to avoid anything that's close to a 45. Get them as straight as I can. And if I go and uh, straighten this now. There we go. The last thing I'm going to do is just even these things out. So I want to take my vertices from the top and under transform. We can go and distribute in U. I didn't do what it was supposed to do. Let's try the bottom here too. There we go. So all this is doing is just giving me a perfectly straight. So instead of having um, stepping all the way around the front of the barrel, I'm now going to have perfectly clean UVs along the barrel. So you can see my pile of, uh, of completed stuff is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, this is done as well. We can move this over here. I've got the uh, the inner barrel and the outer barrel, which we'll just go grab a bottom edge on both and unfold both. This one will be a perfect rectangle kind of already. We'll just go and straighten it. And this one will be close to a perfect rectangle. And I'll go straighten it. It's not going to be perfect here, so we'll optimize and straighten. Let's see if that works. It does not. So what I'm going to do is grab the rightmost edge. I'm going to move it out. I'm going to scale it in. I'll grab the leftmost edge. And I'll move it out. Missed one. And I'll scale it in like so. Now there is a there's a little bit of overlap here that I can I can see where some of these faces are actually on top of another face. So what I want to do is make sure that they're all in the right order. That's fine. That's fine. They look all okay now. Yeah. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and space out those edges again. So under transform, uh, I can go and hit that distribute U. In fact, if I do all of them, yeah, that's not going to work. Edge distribute. Zoom in to make this go a little bit faster. Uh, and this is just going to clean up the UVs on this as well. So again, I won't end up with any distortion in my bake here. I'll end up with really nice, clean UVs. So I do this with as many round pieces as I can. Try to get the uh, try to get the UVs to end up in a really really nice place, like so, and like so, and like so. And this will give me the best possible 
bake that I can get. Because again, everything depends on this bake. The cleaner the bake, the better all of your texturing is going to be. So there's now the outer barrel and the inner barrel, which can go to the collection. We've got the Picatinny rail um, support here. So this one's going to be pretty easy to do. Uh, if I isolate it here, it's essentially just a box. So if I take the front of the box off, like so, I'm going to not include anything from the back here. So we'll get rid of all of that. Um, and I do a planar map on that. We'll just move this over here. We'll hit a unfold on that. A layout just to get it in the right place. So there's that guy. That thing's good to go. I'll do the same thing around the back. I'll take the back off, which again, I will ignore any parts that exist on here. That's just that loop, uh, which again, I will planar map to cut it, unfold it, lay it out, and just get it a little bit straighter. Again, I'm gonna go and align these to edge in a moment. Uh, I then wanna cut off the, the support here at the back where the screw is. So I will select those edges. Let go all the way around. Like so, which should give me this as a separate piece. I will break the bottom corner, which is going to get me most of the way there. The hole is going to be a problem. And you can see that the holes don't know what to do. So that's easy too. We're just going to break the holes off. I'll do the inside so that my, I don't end up with a UV seam where it's visible, but it's going to be inside where it's not visible. I'm going to do a split there. That should give me the inside versus the outside. So these things should unwrap a little bit cleaner. And now I can take my center edge, orient those. Uh, this probably makes more sense if they're both going the same way. So I'll turn this. That way when they get packed, they can get packed like that. We'll go to edges and we'll align these, uh, orient to edges. And that's good. And that's good. Into the pile you go. We now have the little support bolt here. And so this is going to be pretty easy. I'm going to go around the cylinder, around the cylinder, or around the cylinder, around the cylinder, around the cylinder, and around the cylinder. And then on this side, around the cylinder, and I'll grab the top edges all the way along and split those. And this should be perfect. Uh, it is not. Oh, I got an extra edge here that I missed. Again, we'll give that an unfold. These are not breaking as they should, so there's an edge somewhere there they are. There. Let's make sure that seam does go all the way around. So I can break that, and these should now. There we go. So we'll go and pack these. And then again, I'm gonna make sure that they're really nice and clean. And orient those all straight and these can go into the done pile and we've got these two pieces and then the slide so this place this piece should be pretty good on its own um, let's see what's going on here it should just unwrap I'm not sure why I did not like this has non-manifold geometry. Oh, you don't say. There it is right there. So there's a hole in this thing right there. I can see where there's a uh, an edge that goes somewhere right here that does not actually connect to anything. Uh, so we'll multi-cut from the corner into the middle here. Like that. And then we can uh, just go and weld those two things together which should then do another planar map on this thing. 
There is another error on it somewhere. I'm not seeing any more edges, any more seams appear, uh, which makes me think that the topology is actually okay. Um, let's try with our planar projection, rotate it so that it's pointing in the right direction here. We'll bring it in. Okay, let's let's find out where the seam is here. Let's go break this, edit mesh, and merge. There was one. There you are up there. That should fix it. So it's not letting me weld this, uh, which means that there are actually more things going on here than I'm privy to. There we go. Okay, grab this, orient it. And we've got the front cap done. We've got the front iron sight and the front bolt. So the front bolt won't unwrap for the same reason none of the other ones have been able to which is that it contains a back face on it. So just grab this, control grab polygons and delete. Grab all of this and hit um, unfold. And that'll be good. Put it in the pile. Then there's this guy, which is here. And I'm gonna just split the three edges in the front. And leave the long one and grab the three edges in the back. And we'll break those. I'll grab the face on the bottom and delete it, just like everything else. And this should now unfold. I'll have to straighten it. Looks like I missed an edge. You. There we go. We'll take that and we'll move it over here. Move that over here. And then finally, the most complex piece, which is the slide. I'm just going to break the front off. So this will be faster by actually going to polygons and just removing that. We'll do a planar projection on that and unfold it. Just move it up here. Let's go to the inner workings of this piece. So essentially what I'm going to do here is I'm going to separate it into the components that are inside versus outside. And what that's going to do is give me the ability to then do all around here, um, just separate those two things. So again, a planar projection on this, unfold it. I'm gonna have to go put a break in here. I'll just do it here. And that should unfold a little bit better. That's really not ideal. That's an ugly shape that's going to have a hard time packing anywhere. Uh, we'll continue with it. We got the bottom of the slide here. So this whole piece at the bottom, um, which is mostly hidden from view, I will separate into its own piece as well. Again, because it's kind of separate and we can't see it, um, it makes sense to just have it as its own island somewhere kind of off in the distance. And then these guys. So again, I'll put a planar projection on that and unfold and we get that piece. And I'll do the back of this as a separate piece. So you can see that it's actually a lot faster in some regards um, to you don't like that. Um, to just do a planar projection on this stuff. So this piece is causing an issue here. Uh, so I'm gonna box map it instead of planar. And there we go. Okay, that guy's good to go. I wanna make sure that these, well, no, though, actually those two are fine. Let's straighten this one and we can put it in the pile. Straighten this. And those can go in the pile. It's just this guy left. And get these away from the uh, 
put them over here. Okay, so that leaves me with this. There's just the uh, the back plate here that once I get this removed, um, we should end up with all the pieces we need. So I'm going to take this guy off. This is the cutaway where the iron sight goes at the back, which again, I'll do a planar projection and unfold, lay out, and straighten, and move. And then we'll take this piece, and there's only just the back here that I want. So I'm going to take all of this, just the rear of this piece. Now, uh, if you're paying attention to the time here, you'll have noticed that I've spent uh, a good hour, 45 minutes here, unwrapping this thing. And we haven't done any texturing. And this may be causing you to have a certain level of concern of uh, what's going on. You know, and we haven't got to the part yet that is the most important part. And I am not concerned, again, because of how quick and easy things are going to be inside of the painter world. So I'm going to unfold these two pieces. And there we go. So this is the inside of the piece. I'm not concerned because Substance Painter is really quick and easy to do. And so all I really need to do is just get the uh, the pieces ready to go here. Um, and we will be able to do this without issue inside of Substance Painter. Um, and so that's why I'm not concerned. It's tw 20 minutes inside of Substance Painter and we'll be, uh, we'll be good to go. So spending the time doing this, making sure that your UVs are as clean as you can get them, again, is kind of the, the utmost importance here. Um, this is the, the important part of doing the unwraps or of doing the, uh, the texturing rather, is that we, we need to get this stuff to a point that it's usable. Um, otherwise we'll never be able to texture anything here in a way that is going to be suitable. And so that's why I'm spending all of this time. Well, that's interesting. There's some faces in there that should not actually exist. Let's grab this again. Do a box projection again. Intriguing. So there is actually an error in here. Yeah, you come across all these little errors in your model. You weren't careful when you were modeling or you did it quickly. So I'm still getting a little bit of an error here. There's something uh, amiss with the back of this thing where something is not lining up the way that it's supposed to. Oh, there we go. Put that piece over there. Let's try and re-unfold these pieces. There we go. They get nice and straight. We'll do that. Orient to edge. I'll put these over here. I've got a single polygon. This is usually something I try to avoid. Um, where you just get these one of these faces here. But in this case, it's the side of this thing, which is really the shape that it's supposed to have. So I'm going to orient it and I'll straighten it and I'll just put it somewhere. It'll pack pretty easy because it's a single quad, but let's go and take a look at this guy and see what else we have here. So it looks like that, that, that all the way around is missing an edge in here. So I'll break that and then this thing should Do not break. Hmm. Mystery geometry. Okay, so that should now break.
There we go. And there we go, nice and clean. Okay, so now that I've got all of the pieces over in the done pile, I'm gonna get out of here, out of, out of isolation mode. Now that I've got them all in the done pile, what I'm gonna do is select my whole pile and I'm gonna hit layout. Now I've been straightening them as I've been going. This is gonna take a little bit longer to lay out, obviously because there's a lot more geometry here uh, than there was when I first started. And Maya will go and pack this as best as, as it can inside of this little box. So there we have a really decent layout for my UVs. Everything's packed really nice and clean. The settings that I'm using here, I'm going to go to modify layout and show you what I'm doing for these settings here. Where's layout? There you are. So first I'm picking my texture resolution, which is 2048 by 2048. I'm giving it packing iterations. I'm giving this 10. So what the software is going to do is it's actually going to go through all of the, the UV packing 10 times and try to get the best result it can. So after it does it 10 times, the best, uh, the best version it was able to come up with is what we're going to be left with. And so that gives us what we've got here. Um, I'm not rotating. I've got pre-rotation, uh, my shell pre-rotation turned off. Why? Well, because I went and aligned all of these pieces to be straight. If I turn this on, it's going to start skewing them to fit some of the pieces that aren't rectangular. And I don't actually want it to do that. And so by keeping the pre-rotation turned off, I'm the one who picks and chooses how these things get laid out. Which, if you look at this, is giving me a pretty good and clean layout. We're translating the shells, but not rotating them. Again, I've got my, te my texture size, and then most importantly, the padding. Now this is picking the number of pixels between each island. And this is now done. So with that, I can now close this, save my file, and I can now export all of this to get it into Painter. So step one, select the whole low polygon file, export selection. Make sure you export selection. If you export all, you're gonna put your high poly and your low poly in the same file. So I'm gonna export selection, and we'll go put this in the right folder. So projects, TT33, and I'm gonna create a new folder now called FBX. I'm in the FBX export, so I will name this TT33. I now have the low poly exported. We'll move over to the high poly. We're gonna hide the low. Get the high, I'm gonna hit three on the keyboard here so we can see that high poly. And again, I didn't do the barrel. So we'll do this really quick. And a bevel here. Uh, let's undo that. Let's do all of them at once. This, 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 this. Over here. This, this. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll bevel two segments or three that's good and then same thing around here i'll grab the end gone control and grab the edges we'll bevel that with the same two three and i'll bring this down as well to make it nice and clean and then just the back of this is good and the underside of this and the one edge that connects these okay and this and this okay good enough i'm not going to get a really clean bake in here uh, but that's because i'm trying to speed this up along here um in order to get this uh to a point where we're we're moving forward okay so we'll get out of here here's my high poly now ready to go now i'm gonna get out of this mode out of the high poly mode um and i'm going to be exporting the high poly in a different uh format than i do the low and this is to help me keep them separate so first mesh smooth 
I'm going to go make sure that I have three iterations of my smooth and hit apply. And this is going to give me my actual high poly geometry, like so. Okay, there we have the actual high poly geometry. I can now say file and export selection. And I'm going to switch from FBX for the high poly to OBJ. Now, there's a couple of reasons that I do this. First, OBJ OBJs are really, really simple file format. And the reason that I want to export it as an OBJ is to also be able to keep it separate from the high poly, to be able to track which is which. So I'll call this TT33High. And I'll let it export. It'll take a moment for it to do so. I'll let the little spinning wheel here in Windows stop. And as soon as this has come to an end, which should be any second here, there we go, I'm going to hit undo. And I'm going to hit undo to remove the high poly of the weapon. I want it to go back to just its default topology here. The reason I want that is that it'll it'll inflate my file size if I export this or save this file now with a ton of geometry in here. So while that's going into Painter, we go. So here's Painter. This uh, is a little bit uh, different than some software in that you'll notice when it opens, it opens without anything in it. So there's no there's no file by default here. It's kind of like Photoshop in that uh, I can't actually start painting on anything. There's there's nothing here. It's just the software. So let's go and set up our file. I'm going to say File New. And we're going to go and pick and choose, A, the material type we want. I'm using PBR, Metallic Roughness. This should be on by default. If it's not, you can choose it from the dropdown. I'm going to pick my texture resolution, which is 2K. And I'm going to select my model. So this is going to be going to our TT33 folder and the FBX. So it's the low poly that it wants here. That's the thing that we're texturing. All of the other... Um, Settings here should be just left as default. We don't want to recalculate normals or anything like that. Uh, we don't want to use a UV tile workflow. We're not using UDIMs. We're just using a single material on this, and so that'll be fine. And I'm going to hit OK. And if everything works out just fine, you should see your asset appear in the middle of your world. Now, the viewport controls here are identical to Maya, so that's going to make moving around pretty quick and easy. The one thing that's a little bit different here is that we actually have a background image, which is lighting our object. We're using a image-based lighting system, or IBL. And what this allows me to do is if I hold Shift and I right-click and drag... I can actually rotate the image around so that I'm seeing the light at different points of the model. This makes it easy to texture places that may be in shadow because of the uh, the the lighting. Now, you'll notice, I'm just going to move this guy out of the way here temporarily. You'll notice that if I hold shift on the keyboard here, we actually get a list of all the shortcut keys in the, uh, in the menu and how they relate to the camera system. So that's going to be super useful. Now, before we do anything, we're going to go into our, I have some, tiles over here. I have layers. This is for the texturing. This is like Photoshop. I have texture set list. Here contains all of the materials we're using. So again, our pistol is just using one texture. So we only have that one texture here or that one material list, um, which is called TT33. This is the name that we set in Maya. Now, again, if this was a vehicle and we had, you know, car paint and rubber and all of those different things, they would all show up here as different lists. But we're only doing one, so that's the only thing we're going to see. Next, we have the texture set settings, which are the settings for that material. This is where we can go do our baking. So here are the seven maps we're going to bake. I'm going to hit the Bake Mesh Maps button. And this will open the baking dialog. Now, the first thing that I want to do is I want to import my high poly. So we're in the common settings here, the common parameters. I'm going to go to the high poly meshes here, and I'm going to hit the browse. And I'll go to my OBJ folder, and I'll grab the high poly. 
Next, our texture resolution. Now this is only for the bakes. This is not the end texture for our model, but I still want it to match. There's no point in baking lower resolution. Dilation width is how far outside of your UV islands the texture will continue baking. This is good for removing seams. I'm gonna leave the default here. I'm gonna move down and the max frontal distance and max rear distance this is how far outside of your model the cage is going to look to find the high poly. Again, as long as you've got your model set to scale, these tend to work pretty good by default. We're going to move down a little bit further and we are going to look for anti-aliasing. This is going to blur our bakes a little bit in order to make them look a little bit cleaner. So I'll choose the eight times subsampling. Match. Now this has to do with how the bake is going to work. If I leave this at always, my entire pistol will see my entire pistol. This means that the body of the pistol will get the hand grip baked into it. That's not what we want. We went and separated everything by underscore low and underscore high. So I'm going to use the match by mesh name. This is going to make sure that trigger underscore low can only see trigger underscore high. It'll see the, just that one mesh. Here's the extensions it's looking for for the separation. And again, these are the Substance Painter defaults, which is why we're using them in Maya. It just makes things a lot easier. Finally, there's also the ignore back face suffix, which we didn't use in this case. Next, we can go select on each one of the seven maps to go choose properties for them. The only ones that I want to change are the ID map. I'm going to make this go to mesh ID or polygroup. This means that every single mesh that is a separate entity, meaning the trigger, the hammer, the iron sights, is going to get a different color in the ID map. This is going to allow us to actually use them a little bit better. The ambient occlusion, I'm going to turn up the secondary rays, and I'm also going to make sure that the self occlusion is set to only by mesh name. This means that the slide won't cast a shadow on the barrel, which is important when the slide gets animated and pulled back so that we can see the barrel. Thickness as well, we can turn the slider all the way up for secondary rays, and we can also only match by mesh name. When you're done setting all of those settings, you're going to hit Bake Selected Textures. Now this is going to take some time, the longest of which will be the importing of the high poly. Now, if I take this over here, we'll see what happens when that bake starts to happen. We should see each of the meshes populate. So the first one, that was the ID map. Now the inclusion. We should see And what is global illumination? It's lighting the mesh from direction, and it's shadows start filling with dark so wherever you get back uh, the further into the light bounces the, uh, the darker the shadows are going to be so and i were to draw this here for you so you can see if you were to have a chasm on a surface and a light coming from here when that light impacts the surface here it's going to be at a hundred percent giving you a white surface that light is going to bounce off and then hit the wall here. If this object was, say, 50% gray, it's going to lose 50% of its power, meaning by the time that light ray hits here, it's only going to be 50% gray. Then it bounces to here, and it's going to become 25% gray, to here, 12.5, and so on, all the way down until it reaches near black. That's what ambient occlusion is. It's that gradient of color you get as light bounces kind of fall off down during this, uh, during this process. Now, I've got my settings here turned up so that I'm doing eight times anti-aliasing on an ambient occlusion. Which why is file for this to bake? Uh, eight times ambient occlusion or eight times anti-aliasing on, uh, on an uh, ambient occlusion bake can, can take some time. In fact, the... Um, the the secondary rays turning those up to 256 and also turning on by mesh name also slow down this bake 
some meshes don't need you to do this. You know, if I was working on a, uh, a human being uh, that was, let's say, for the most part naked, um, you know, let's say someone like a wrestler wearing just, you know, some briefs kind of thing. Well, that wrestler, I wouldn't need to do by mesh. You know, I'd be able to bake it just the way it is. Uh, it would work just fine. I can see that the, the mesh has switched over to becoming grayscale, which means the ambient occlusion is now actually baking. First, we're going to see this whole mesh. The shadows. And I've got this turned up because, again, these are responsible for the quality of your texture. If these maps don't agree well, you're going to have issues. So when we put rust or damage or anything like that on these weapons, the maps are what allows the rust to act in the place or dust and things like that. So that's what these maps are going to be used for. Now, while this is going, I'm going to introduce you to a web page here called Substance Share. Now, when you've got a license to Substance, you have the ability to use uh, one of these websites or this website. This is a collection of materials and uh, similar types of things that have been created by users of Substance, the Substance package that they've uploaded in order for you to uh, have access to them. So these are kind of uh, free to use. Um, I don't want to say plugins, they're just, they're more components for the software, more than what it ships with. Now, the reason that I'm showing you this is that we're going to make use of one of these ones. It's going to be really important. It's called Parkerized Steel. So I'm going to do a search for Parkerized. I'm going to type this into the chat here so you can, you can find it on your own. But it's called Parkerized Steel. And what Parkerized Steel is, is it is a, a metal that is coated, um, which is, is typically what you find most firearms are made out of. So it's got a little bit of a tooth to it, meaning there's a little bit of a bumpy surface on here. And, uh, and it is a really, really nice material that looks an awful lot the way that weapons look. You know, it's not just bare metal. It's been coated to protect it kind of thing. And so all you have to do is then just go hit the download button here. Um, it will ask you to log in and you can use your substance ID here to log into this. And then you can just hit the download button and it'll go grab that for you like this. Now, what this is going to give you, if I open this up, is a SBSAR. This is a substance uh, material that we can then use. This is in a uh, zip folder here. So I would need to extract this. And what you do is you're going to drag that directly into Substance Painter. And let me go back to Painter. I'll check on our bake and a little bit of the. Uh, I can see a little bit of the top of the grip has baked and a little bit of the, uh, the barrel has baked as well. So it's, it's doing its thing. It's just a little bit on the side here. Now, I think do, uh, in order to uh, make sure that we can actually jump into doing the text, here, and I'm going to dumb them down a little bit so that we can actually go and do this in a way that is going to be uh, a little bit more attainable. So I'm going to return these settings back down to 64 for the thickness and the aiming occlusion like so and uh and then i'm going to do a rebake now you can see that the normal map the world space normal and the id map have baked already at that higher setting so i might as well turn those off and then uh actually let's turn off the two expensive ones we'll bake the other two which shouldn't take any time at all uh the curvature is going to look for um negative and curve and positive curvature so wherever anything is uh convex it's going to become white and where anything is concave being pushed in it's going to turn black so this is going to give us the average curvature of the weapon which is what's going to be used to add damage and things like that so again we'll let this go and this one shouldn't take too long You'll notice it's actually able to pick up every single polygon of the low poly. And again, that's because the curvature, when it's being baked from high poly and low, is slightly different in each of those areas. Now, I also didn't properly set up my smoothing on this gun, which is why it's going to look a little ugly here when we do the bake. If we go back over to Maya, 
Oh, it looks like Maya is chugging as well. Okay, we'll let this we'll let this finish. It looks like I uh, I have an issue with Maya here where it's trying to uh, auto save with the high poly still in the scene. So you can see here that it's doing a really good edge of uh, a really good job of finding the edges. Right, that uh, that curvature you can see all those white edges are all showing up now. It's almost like a uh, uh, a soul render or a cell shaded render. So there, that's done, and that's done. So it did those two. Uh, the reason I did that is that I'm going to go into the ambient occlusion and the thickness. And in the settings here, I'm also going to turn off the uh, the subsampling or turn it down. And uh, another bake. So this should actually speed up these two bakes, these are the, the longest of bakes. Um, and so it should speed them up to make them a little bit closer to the other. So it would be not as good. Um, however, it would get them to a point that we can actually go and use. Use uh, our materials to start texturing. So there's the occlusion done. Here's the thick. I'm not actually going to use the thickness for anything on this mesh, but what that would be used for is if you did something uh, with subsurface scattering. So if you had any kind of light penetrating inside of the model, you know, like a candle or a human ear or something like that. So here are now our bakes, and I should be able to go look at it. And you can see wherever I had any UVs that weren't perfectly straight, I'm getting stair-stepping along the edges here. I also am getting uh, really ugly edges occur in some of these places where uh, I didn't do a good enough job in setting up my, my, uh, my softened edges. So if I go back to Maya here, let's minimize this, minimize this. Maya's crap the bed, so that's that's fun. Uh, I'm gonna let this come back, but essentially what's happened is in my low poly, let me open up the low poly in max to show you. I'll be able to do this relatively quick here by just using another software. What am I doing? Projects, uh, let's date modify, TT, FBX, 33. So what we're looking at is the hardened and softened edges on this thing. Um, which I'm just going to go remove its material here so we can we can see this. Uh, if you go look at these these little cutaways that were made, you can see that those edges are hard. And as a result, the bake is having a hard time with that area, making it look really nice and smooth. So what I would have to do is actually go in and soften those edges in Maya uh, to make them usable. Here we go. The high poly finally finished. So if I go back to my channel, we'll hide that one and make this one visible. We'll see that here, that those edges are actually hard on the slide. So what I need to do to fix this is I need to go into those edges. Oh, that's rather bizarre. Uh, I need to go into those edges, like so. And I need to tell them all to be softened edges. So all of those edges, if I go into Mesh Display and I say Soften, that will now actually give it a little bit more of an impression of that thing being rounded, which is what it's supposed to have, instead of these hard edges here. And so that, you're going to see that's the case on a few places on the pistol here. Underneath the grip, you can see those same edges that are hard there. I didn't, I didn't soften any of this stuff. And so that would be really, really, really important um, to, uh, to making this look correct is making sure that edges that are supposed to be hard are hard and edges that are soft should be soft. So let's go back into Painter because I don't have time to fix this in order to start texturing it. Let me show you how we would bring in the parkerized steel if you so needed it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go uh, grab this in my download folder here. And what I would do I'm just going to move this onto my desktop here, so it's a little easier to use. There we go. So I've got it on my desktop here. Here it is here, Parkerized Steel. And what I would do is I would drag that into the shelf down here. And when I let that go, we can close this window. This guy will pop up. And I'm going to tell it this is not undefined, but it's a new base material. And then I would hit Import. We can also say, do you want to bring that in for just this session of using Substance Painter? Do we want to make it attached to this uh, project? So this, this pistol that I'm making, or do we want to make it a permanent addition to the software? I've already made it a permanent addition, so it actually shows up here already for me. So let's go see how we start to work on this now. So I'm going to go to my layers. I'm going to delete the main layer. And the idea now is that I want to kind of think about the manufacturing process of this item. 
So how was this made and how is it going to be uh, put together? And it's going to be made by first being metal and then being coated with, you know, paint and, and probably uh, parkerization to make it, you know, uh, protected from the elements. Uh, we're going to have plastic grips that get bolted to it. The Picatinny stuff is plastic. We might have a different kind of metal inside of the uh, the little rings and stuff like this. And so that's what we kind of want to pay attention to. So I'm going to do that first. I'm going to grab the parkerized steel and drag that into the folder. And this is going to show us what the parkerized steel looks like. So it's this kind of little bumpy thing here. Now, if I select that material, that layer, I have some settings for it here. First, it's using UV projection, which means it's looking at my UVs, which I can show you here if we go to 2D view, and it's just filling the canvas with parkerized steel. So that's kind of useful. That's what's giving us this look. But we can also change that to be a triplanar projection, which means it's going to project it along X, Y, and Z, giving us a different resolution and a different look to this. I'm going to put it back onto UVs because my UVs are pretty good. Now, this is that triplanar projection is how you can compensate for having warped UVs and ugly UVs. And not all things allow you to triplanar project. So you do have to be careful with that. You'll notice that the paint color in the uh, Parkerized Steel is kind of a bluish color, which is fine. Uh, I might make this a little bit more on the black side of things. I want the pistol to look black. I'm also looking at the little gnarly uh, bumps that are on here, these little kind of detail that's here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the scale and I'm going to shrink this down until that actually starts looking more like a pistol. So the scale is a little bit off here. I want to avoid, you see if I go down too small, we can see repetition in the pattern. So I want to avoid doing that. And I want to get it just to the size that it starts looking a little bit more like a pistol. There's also a couple of other settings that we can play with here. You can see that the uh, the parkerized steel, uh, oh, actually this is steel painted. This is not parkerized steel. I mean the wrong material here altogether. Uh, here is the parkerized steel. I grabbed the wrong one. So let's go into that scale now and set this to be accurate. So somewhere about here. Um, and what I can do now is I can go in and play with the amount of scratches on this thing. So if I turn this up, you see a nice big scratch appeared here. There's one there. There's one there. Um, so you can play with how scratched up this material is. I'm not going to keep the scratches too high. It's got a dirt slider as well, which contains uh, how much dirt you want to have on this. And I'm going to not play with that either. In fact, I'm going to leave all the settings pretty default here. For now. Now, the biggest thing with using Substance Painter is subtlety. That's what makes things look really, really good, is adding subtlety to them. So I've got, oh, I can see there's an error in my barrel. Look, something did not bake correctly here. So this means that I've either got a UV issue with this uh, that's going to need to get tweaked. And it looks like it is indeed UVs. I can see a compression in the texture here. If I move this around, I can see that there's a compression in here. So it looks like one of the UV islands got squished in or one of the rows of polygons got squished in and one of them actually looks like it's not unwrapped at all. So this is probably overlap here. So I'm going to need to go and adjust that in my low poly, but let's keep moving forward here. So there's my parkerized steel. That's what the majority of this weapon is going to be made out of. Uh, I also need to have plastic in for the uh, the holder and the, the grip here as well. I also want to have some details like... Uh, uh, cross hatching on this little button. You know, it's supposed to be textured and I didn't model any of that in. So here's what we're going to do. We have two new kinds of layers that we can create. A paint layer, which allows you to go and paint on the object. You can see here I went and drew and made some scriggly marks. And we can add a fill layer. And a fill layer is just going to fill the entire object. So I'm going to start with a paint layer and I'm going to go rename this uh, additional normals because I'm going to add the normals now that I didn't bother creating in my high poly. This is going to include things like the text and whatnot. I can see there's another UV problem here too. See right here? All of that stretching that's going on, that's something that I did wrong with my UVs. There's a polygon there that doesn't have enough UV space and it's warping that. Now I can try and switch this to uh, triplanar and it may fix that depending on the, uh, the issues with the UVs you can see in this case. It does not. So anyway, we're going to go with this. 
this additional normal is I want to put cross hatching on here. Now, the thing that separates this from so, from uh, um, Photoshop is that we're doing all of these different channels at the same time. So this is a list of my layers. I have my steel parkerized here and I have an additional normals here. Each one of these contains color, height, roughness, metallic, and normal. And I can switch between which one of these things we're looking at. So right now I'm looking at the base color of the parkerized steel. And as such, I can change the color of the parkerized steel. If I go into the roughness, it's now the roughness category that I'm looking here. Now this doesn't change the properties of the material, but what it does change is the transparency of the layer. So right now, this is a normal layer at 100%, and you can see I can bring it down to 11%. Now we're seeing the underlying layer show through. But this is just the color showing through. This is just the opacity for the color. If I switch to the height, I now have a transparency for the height. And you can see I can make that bumpiness go away or become very, very subtle. So this gives you a a very, very fine uh, level of control over how your materials are being applied. Now, the reason to bring this up is that in my additional normals here, which is a paint layer, I am actually painting, if we look in our properties and go to the material button, I'm painting in color, height, roughness, and metal. And I'm painting using the paint material that I already clicked on earlier, which is not exactly what I want. Now, because I only want to paint in the height information, I'm going to turn off the other layers, meaning when I click and draw now, it's just going to add height information. If I were to add color information and we were going to go make this baby blue and I were to go and paint, it would then give us only baby blue. Now, this is underneath the other layer, so we can't see it. If it was above, we could then see the paint that I'm adding. The reason we can see the height, if I turn this off and go to height, is that my height is set to be additive, meaning whatever happens to a lower layer, that height carries through to the upper layers. So that's why this is going to be a really neat thing to be able to do. So here's my height information, and in the height information, uh, we are going to go, let's see, here's the material. I'm gonna kill this material, I don't want this material. And now I have my base color, we don't want. Height, I do want. I don't want roughness, metal, or normal. I just want height. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this button and I'm gonna go find some kind of a pattern here in the software that's gonna look good for this. So I'm gonna look for maybe cross hatching. Let's see, cross. And I've got some different kinds of textures here that show up. Here you can see some, some interesting kind of little patterns. I scroll down, there's all kinds of little things that you can pick from. Here's a square triangle. I'm going to pick that. And uh, actually, that's not going to work as I'm in a paint layer, which means I'm going to paint that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this layer a fill. Or no, actually, let's do it like this. Let's do paint. Let's go back and put that guy on. So I'm going to make my brush nice and big. And uh, we can play around with the properties of this thing. So we can make it bigger or smaller. And uh, I can also go and adjust my brush so that it, uh, it doesn't fade out. So there's my stroke opacity, the spacing, the size, the flow, and all this stuff. And if I just go click on this button, you can see that it's going to give us some height information on there. Now I can go into this layer and turn down the opacity. Oh, I'm in base color. Let's switch this to height, which is where I'm painting. And I'll pull the opacity down, and you can see that I can actually get this to be really subtle or really strong. If I don't like it altogether, I'll turn the strength back up, I can switch over to the eraser, and I can actually click and erase it. If I go back to my brush, I can see that that is probably not the pattern that I want. Let's grab something a little bit more complex and click on that. So that's a little bit better. That's a little closer to the shape that I want. Uh, I'm going to bring down the stroke opacity because it's going on there really, really strong. And what I want to do is get to the point that it just looks like it's kind of embossed like that. 
Now, when I look at my stroke here, you can see that it's appeared on the background of this piece a lot. So if I go to my eraser and bring its size down, I can actually go and erase all the way around it on that piece of metal to get rid of the stuff that we didn't intend to be there. I want to be careful I don't go onto the button. I don't actually want to erase the button. But I can erase all of the side stuff here, and that'll give me a little bit of a cleaner effect. And there, I've now got a little bit of a texture on that button, so it'll make a little bit more sense when you press it. If I were to look into my TT33 reference material, there's going to be writing and texture on the grip as well. Um, there's the Soviet star. If I do logo in here, uh, I'll be able to find the, the Tokarev logo, which is brilliant. That's what I need to put on the grip. You can see also the grip has a diamond plating on it kind of thing that I'm going to need to achieve. So we can go and add that in now. So that circle logo is going to go in here somewhere. I'm going to leave that for now, and I'm going to go and add the diamond plating. So to do that, I'm going to go and make my brush here. So there's my brush. Make it nice and big. And uh, and I'm going to go in again. Uh, let's make sure we're on the brush setting. I'm in height here. We're going to turn this on. And let's look for diamond. And indeed, I have several diamond patterns here that I can pick from. Absolutely, Lev. You can import as many images as you want. So all of these patterns that are showing up, are from the alphas category, which is just a black and white image that you can import. So that Tokarev logo that I want to put on here, let me show you how I would do that. So I'm going to grab the logo. I'm going to try and find one that is uh, nice and clean here. And I'm going to copy this. We're going to bring it into Photoshop. And I need to prepare it in Photoshop to be used. So that's going to be, um, I, I can't have three colors. I want to have just black and white. And so I'm going to go in and fiddle with this until it is actually what I want. So I'm going to use white as being raised and black as being recessed. So in Photoshop, we can go and do this. Now, if you were to be making an entire line of Tokarev weapons, you might want to, again, import that image in here as a permanent thing, right? You might actually want to have a Tokarev logo as part of the software. Um, what's going on with Photoshop? Let's try that again. It looks like it's having a problem reading my preferences. Let's go in. There we go. So let this kick in a second. File new. I'm going to use my clipboard here and create. Now, I always want to make sure that my anything that I create for this is square. When I go to image size, I want to make sure that the pixels are even here. So see 466 by 465. I'm going to stretch this one pixel so that it is perfectly square. Um, because it'll work better in Painter that way. Painter will, will actually make it square. So if I can do that, it'll work. So I'm going to uh, desaturate this, adjust the levels. And uh, I'm going to make sure the black is black and that the white is white. But I'm also going to make sure that the gray is white. So I'll do that. And then I'm going to do the levels again just to bring the whites up all the way. Like so. And then I'm going to do, uh, I want to get rid of the background here. So I'll select the whole background. I'm going to go select, modify, contract, and I'll contract it by eight pixels and fill it with black. And there, I now have I now have a height version of the logo. Now, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go filter, blur, and Gaussian blur this. I don't want to blur it to the point that it's unrecognizable, but I'm going to use a blur to kind of soften the edges a little bit. And then I'll just save this on my desktop. Okay, so we'll go to desktop. I'm going to save it as a PNG, and I'll call it the TT33 logo, like so. And then to bring that into the software, it's the same way that we would bring in one of the materials. So I would open up a folder, I would go to my desktop, I would find the logo, which is here, and I'm going to drag it onto the shelf. Once you drag it onto the shelf, this window applies. I'm going to say, make this an alpha. 
and only do it for the current session. I don't actually want to have this part of the software. So I'll say import, and there it is there. I now have my logo, and I can actually drag this onto the height. And now I'm going to go and paint this onto my grip. So I'll make my brush nice and high res. I'm going to bring the stroke opacity back up again, and I can click. And there it is now in the grip. I'll put one on the other side too. Now you can turn on symmetry if you want. There is a symmetry button right here, which will cut your model. It actually shows you where your symmetry line is. You can see that it's actually offset on mine. Now it uses the geometry here. And because I have Picatinny on one side, it's not symmetrical. So I would actually have to use the settings and I would have to move it a little bit to make it centered. Uh, but this is, I don't want to center this because it's got letters on it, right? And I don't want those letters to be backwards. So there it is there. And I have that. Um, let's undo that and let's put the diamond plating on here first. So I'm gonna go and scale this guy up. We're gonna, again, look for diamonds and we'll see if we can't find some really nice diamond plating for the grip. Maybe I'll do something like that. We're gonna increase the number of tiles here and I'm gonna click right on that. Now, I do want to make sure that I'm only clicking on the uh, on the piece. You can see that's going to overwrite a lot of stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let's turn on symmetry, even though the symmetry is off here. I'm going to do this like this. Let's turn down the uh, stroke opacity as well. I'll make this really, really light. There we go. So that looks a lot more like a grip type material. Uh, and the reason that I want to go and do it like this is that if I go into my UVs now, 2D only, we can actually use the eraser to go remove it from components where it shouldn't be. So I can actually go and erase here. Now you notice when I erase on the magazine, it's erasing on the grip. And that's because the way that the brush is set up is to work with a tangent wrap. If I switch this to UVs, now I can erase and should just get the UVs. It isn't. It's getting both. So I'm going to do this in a completely different way. That apparently is not going to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a fill to this layer. And in the fill, I only want to add height information. And I will add that diamond plating information. I'll tile it until I get the effect that I want on the grip. We can play with the dimensions of it here. We can play with the, uh, not the scale. I want to get the scale about right. Uh, offset, offset. No, that's all I want. I'm going to take the opacity of the fill and turn it down. Until we get, again, something that's uh, a little bit closer to what we want. And again, there's all kinds of other little patterns and things in here that you can pick from. Uh, I think I actually do have a proper diamond grip plating in here that uh, I can put on, which will look a lot more like the uh, the object is supposed to have. Now, what I'm going to do with this layer is I'm going to add a mask to it. So I'm going to add a black mask. And then what I can do is I can use this selection tool, the fourth one down, and I can go and select places where I want the mask to be white. So if I choose the grips like this, turn off symmetry, and I can even go and select the faces of this button. And then I'll put this grip pattern on the button here too. Let's just use the whole thing. And so that'll put that uh, that little grip information on there. So you can see I have that. Now, if I go back to my paint layer here and I choose my Tokarev logo as my alpha. I should be able to go and click on it. Let's go add another paint layer. Oh, I'm on the eraser. That's why that's not working. Make sure you're using the right tool. Let's bring the opacity back up. Let's also kill the height information that's here. Let's kill the alpha. Let's put that in the height information. And I should be able to now just click this back in and get the effect that I want. I can go into the eraser here and I can kill that from the eraser. I can go and tidy up that little edge if I wanted. Would you get the idea? Let's go and do some uh, some more materials here. So I've got my steel parker eyes. So far, we're not looking uh, so good here. So let's go into our materials. 
and let's do the uh, let's do the plastic that we're gonna put on here. So here's a grainy plastic, and I'll put this above. I'm gonna bring the scale down till it looks the way it should. There's something like that. Again, I find that bump a little overpowering. So in the height, I'm gonna turn it down. And you can see that that's not actually doing anything. So let's try the normal and see if the height information is in the normal. And indeed it is. Well, that's the metallic normal. Let's try and pull that down. There it is. So I'm just going to get this to be a little bit softer for the plastic here. Now, I only want this plastic to be on the plastic. So I'm going to add a black mask, which is going to mask out the whole thing in black so we can't see it. I'll go to selection object mode and I can click now on the bits that I want to be made out of plastic. So that's going to be the all of the Picatinny rail system and the grip. And now I've got those two different materials on here going the way that I want them. If I wanted the grip to be made out of uh, instead of out of plastic, again, we could go into our selection, turn the color to black and select the grips so that they don't become plastic. And then we can go add another layer here. So if I were to go find wood, here's a wood material. I can go and place this on. I'm gonna go into my scale and set this up until I have the grain kind of the way that I want it to. I don't want the grain to go sideways, I want it to go up and down. So I can use the rotation to rotate it. Then I can add a black mask Go to selection mode, make sure I'm changing the mask to white, and click on the grips. And now the grips will be textured and made out of wood. If I wanted to add a little bit of wear to the whole weapon, again, I'm going to layer things on top. You can see here we can play around with the color too. If you're not really pleased with that color, we can go and desaturate it. Let's make sure we're on the right layer here. We can go and desaturate it. We can make it darker. We can make it a really dark walnut grip. You get the idea. But let's go and add some damage to the weapon. I'm going to go to my Parkerized Steel. And I'm going to add a steel material below it. So I'm going to go and find... There's iron and shiny, iron and rough, iron and raw. Let's put iron raw below the Parkerized Steel. And now what I want to do is I want to add damage to the parkerization so that we can see the raw iron through it. Well, that's easy enough to do. In fact, one of the things that I might want to do, let's go and add a white mask to the parkerized steel. Now, a white mask means that we can't see through it. It's completely solid. So one of the things that I can do now is go and select objects that I actually want to be bare metal. Maybe the trigger would look better as bare metal. So we'll go make the mask black. And I'll select the trigger. And now the trigger is actually going to be bare metal, which is also going to make a little bit more sense. Probably makes sense as well to have the inside of the barrel. I'm going to select by UV Island. And I can go make the inside of the barrel also metal. It wouldn't parkerize the inside of this thing. So that'll give us that kind of effect. Next. Let's go and add the damage. So I have this steel here that's got this mask on it. If I right click on the mask, we're going to add a generator to the mask. That's going to generate a specific kind of detail. With the generator selected, I can go to the generator and I can click on it and we can go and add all different kinds of generators. There's a few presets here that are already built in. Here's metal edgeware. I'm going to click on this. And it's going to go start adding edgeware to the gun. Now, if you look at this, it's actually doing it backwards. See, it actually is leaving the parkerization around the contours. So on that metal edgeware, I'm going to go find invert and I'll invert it. And now it's actually starting to wear the metal off around the perimeter. So if you go find any of these edges here, I'm going to spin the camera around. You can see it's starting to come off a little bit. Now, the really nice thing about a material like this is that it's got the wear level. So I can increase the amount of wear, and you can see that all of the chipping starts to happen. Or I can bring it all the way down so that it's very, very minor. 
You can also increase the contrast. So instead of fading out, you get a much more chipped kind of appearance to it. The idea now is to get this to actually look the way that you want it to look. I'm going to bring the contrast back down. And I'm going to give it a little bit of wear. I don't want it to look like it's old and, uh, and dirty. I also don't like the thickness change. So I'm going to go back to my Parkerized Steel. I'm going to go uh, back to its height information. So layer, height. And I'm going to turn the opacity of the height down a little bit. You can see that that's what's controlling that level. So I'm just going to bring it down a little bit, which is going to give it a little bit more of a more realistic look to it. I'll go back to my base color. I'll go back to my raw iron. And that's actually looking pretty decent. You can see the plastic is not wearing in the same way that the metal is. The metal is appearing to be metal. Uh, if I go back to here, we've got our metal edge where you can see the trigger's gone. Remember I made the trigger? Well, that's because this generator has overwritten the mask. So what do you do if you want to make the trigger completely metal? Is it one or the other? Well, no, it's not. If I take the metal edge wear and I add to it a paint, now I can actually go and add to that paint. So for instance, I can grab the trigger and make it that. In fact, the hammer too would also look pretty good in bare metal as would probably the iron sights. Again, looking at reference for this to get it to look the way you want is probably going to be key. But I can imagine the hammer would actually probably look a little bit better as metallic as well. Once you're at a point where you're pretty pleased with it, there's one more thing that we're gonna have to do for our texturing, which is to add that customizationable paint, right? To add the ability to add paint to these things. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add a new paint layer. Now, this is not paint as in, you know, uh, liquid paint on objects. It's paint as in we can paint on the object. And all I'm going to do here is I'm only going to paint in, uh, in one category. So here's our color, height, rough, normal, and, uh, and metal. And what I actually want to do is I want to paint in another one. I don't want our paint mask to be in any one of these things. So what I'm going to do is I'll actually just make this layer paint. Maybe we'll put plastic blue shiny here instead of our paint layer. So there's our paint. I'm going to add a black mask to this. I'll add a generator to the mask. And in the generator, we can go look for paint. So let's type in paint in here and see if there's any paint generators. It doesn't appear that there are. There are only brushes and other types of things. Here's some paint, old paint. Here's one here, paint damaged. So it doesn't look like if I click those, they're going to work. That means that they're not generators. So I'm going to turn them off and go to smart masks. And this is where those things appear. So if I do a search in here for paint, here's our paint. And we have paint damaged. And I'm going to drag that onto the mask. Now I can see what that blue paint is going to look like. And I have some metal edge wear that I can add. So we're going to add some more wear to this. I'm going to turn the grunge amount down. And that's kind of what I want my paint to look like. Now the blue here is insignificant. We don't actually really care about the blue. What we care about is just the mask itself. So what I want to do is I actually want to turn off all of that layer and just keep that mask. I'm happy with the way the mask looks like. That's, that's what I want the paint to look like on my, on my weapon, like somebody's actually gone and painted it. So that's what I'm going to use, but I'm going to turn off the layer because we're going to export that mask as something separate. Now I'm going to go and add some dirt. So I'm going to go and create a new layer. Let's use this blue plastic again. And I'll go and drag it above my mesh. And let's go change the properties of this blue plastic to make it look like dirt. So from blue, we'll go to kind of a grimy brown color. That's too shiny for dirt. So I'll take the roughness and I'll increase it. Dirt is not metal, so I'm going to leave the metallic value at zero. If I bring this up, it's going to really break the look of things. So I'm going to keep it down. I might even go and pull the saturation down a little bit further on this and darken it up just a little bit more. 
Okay. Next, in order to make this dirt, we're going to add a black mask. It's going to get rid of it all. We'll add a generator. We'll click on generator. We'll reset the settings here. And here is one called dirt. I'll click on it. And it's going to go and add dirt to my pistol. So if I go and spin around here, we can see how that dirt's being added. Again, with the dirt selected, we have a amount of dirt. So we can make it really dirty or kind of somewhat dirty. We can increase the contrast so that it looks a little bit more like mud. Or we can pull the contrast down so that it looks really, really soft and subtle. And I want to kind of just get this to a point where it's just breaking up some of the texture a little bit. And one of the other really strong uh, features that Painter has that, while I'm not going to use it uh, on this particular mesh, I want to kind of show you how it works. Um, I'm going to create a new layer here. Again, another shiny blue plastic. Uh, actually, that's a lie. I'm going to create a paint layer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into not brushes, which is where you have all your different brushes that you can choose from. But I'm going to go into one area here called particles. And particles is one of the really strong features that Painter has for adding uh, adding details and textures and things like that. Um, if I go into, uh, let's go back into the materials here. And I'm going to double click on this blue grainy plastic. And I'm going to go into the particles and I'm going to go and choose one of these particles. Let's choose burn. Let's try start with that one. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to click and draw on this thing. And these particles are going to hit the surface and come off like a burn. Now, I'm actually not painting anything here at the moment. I'm going to go into the base color. And let's go into our material. On that this is not actually showing me the material. Make sure I'm in brush, particle, burn. Turn the height off. There we go. So here, we'll paint. Uh, let's actually make this look like burn. Uh, color, we'll go nice and almost black. Uh, we'll make the roughness 100%. And we'll turn off the uh, the normal and the height, and the we'll leave the metallic on. So if I wanted to add a burn here, I could click on this, and you can see the particles go up like a burn. And each particle is a little tiny brush moving its way up the surface of this thing until you get a little tiny burn. Another one you could do is broken glass, which if I click, it'll add this kind of broken glass effect. This one's really nice if you use height and you add a little bit of height information to it or negative height information and look like a crack in the surface. We can also go into uh, electric lines, which is going to give it kind of a circuit boardy looking thing. Really nice if you're doing sci-fi meshes. And again, all of this is painting with the, the settings that I have here. We've got fracture, which is just going to break this thing up like spider webs. You can see they're still going. We're going to cover the whole mesh. They'll keep going until they run out of mesh. Which is really crazy. Let's undo that. Uh, there's laser impact, which just gives you the impression of a glancing laser beam hit. Gives you these kind of burn things. There's leaks. This is a little bit more uh, more interesting for doing some of these things where you can actually go paint on something and it'll drip down. So again, if I were to go into uh, my materials here, instead of having the roughness all the way up, if I make the rough roughness all the way down, um, let's do it on this side because I haven't painted on this side, and I were to go click along the bottom of this thing, let's give it a little bit of height information too. We can actually make it look like there's oil drips coming down the side of this thing. We also have heavy leak, which is along the same thing, but it's a little bit stronger. Uh, there's liquid stream, which is a large, like a, you're hitting it with a hose kind of thing. 
Uh, and then there's some really, really fun ones like Sandstorm, which if I click and drag here, it's just going to actually hit this whole thing with little pellets that are moving around randomly all, all over the place. And you can see that it's kind of like a sandblasting. They're all hitting it and all painting it in slightly different ways. I'm going to go delete that layer. And when you're happy with this, there's one more thing I want to do, which is to put the text on this thing. Let's go look at the text that should be on this thing. Uh, content, this guy. And we'll get rid of the logo. So I just want to see what the text is that's supposed to be written on this thing, because again, I didn't model that. So I need it to be there somewhere. There's supposed to be some text on this. There it is back there. I'll try and find an image where I can see it clear enough that I can see what's written. It's going to be written in, I would presume in Russian. Here, I'll put I'll put this text in. Okay, so uh, TT Russia 726 times 25. So in Painter, I'm going to go back down to my additional normals down here. On my fill, I'm going to add a paint. My paint now that I'm going to be using uh, is going to be using a, let's go to um, alphas here, and I'll grab a text. So here's a bunch of the text alphas. Uh, we're going to go into materials here. Let's go to this guy. And I want to do this only in height, and I want it to be negative. I want it to be pushed in. Uh, in the alpha category, we're going to grab a text. So I'm going to find a text that fits. We'll use that one. If I make my brush nice and big. You can see what we're getting here. Substance. So it looks like my brush is upside down. Uh, so we'll go find the alignment of the brush, which is somewhere. Size, position, position, alignment, size, center. Where's my rotation? There it is. Oh, let's change our alignment here. Something is going screwy. Oh, I've still got that on. That's why. Let's go to brush and go to a default brush. There we go. Then we'll go to alphas. I still have the particle system on. So we'll grab our text and put it into the alpha so that we get substance. And now I can go into the text and write what it's going to be. So tt dot Russia space 7.26 times 25, which is going to give me the writing. Uh, we're going to make sure that the size of this is small enough that I can see all of it. And now I can use this to scale it up or scale it down. And if I click, let's make sure that we are in height, dropping down. Let's go and do this on a new layer here. We'll add a new new layer, height, down, click, and there we go. I can now go and emboss that into here. So I'm going to undo that. I'm going to bring my stroke opacity down a little bit because I don't need it to be that strong. And there, I can go and add that to my object so that it looks a little bit better. We'll go grab our logo here too, put this here. Uh, before I put the logo in, I'm going to clear a spot on this thing. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll grab the circle brush. And the circle shape. Uh, that's not what I want. Yeah, that's not. That's inky. There's got to be a circle in here somewhere. There we go. I'll turn the hardness up. And uh, I'm going to paint on this layer uh, height information. I just want to click kind of like that to make a circle. And then what I'll do is I'll replace that with the alpha. And we'll get this to match the scale and dimension. I can go and put that in there. I could also just stamp it in on its own. It looks like it's in the wood. So this one gave it an inset, and this one is just the default. And then once you're done, once you're at the point that you're pleased with the way that this thing looks, we just need to export everything. To do that, 
<clears throat> you're also going to need to remember which engine you're working in, whether you've chosen to work in Unreal or you've chosen to work in Unity, because it's going to be different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Export Textures. I will choose a folder. So for this, I'm going to go to Projects. I'll sort these by name. Create a new folder called Textures. And in here, this is called TT33. So I'm naming it the name of the asset. So TT33 and OK. Uh, oh, it's looking for that path. I'm going to select that folder. Yes, I don't. Like that folder. Uh, it's already called TT33. I'm going to go into the output template and I'm going to scroll up. I've got a Uni Unreal 4 one here. If you're working in Unity and you scroll down, and there's some Unity ones in here you can pick from too. So you're going to use Unreal 4 Pact if you're using Unreal. And if you're using uh, Unity, you're going to go to the uh, Unity HD Render Pipeline Metallic Standard. So if I go down here and I grab Unreal Pact, which is what I'm using, I'm going to use PNG 8-bit. And that should be good. Uh, I've got my folder selected, so I should just be able to hit Export and it chugs through. Let's go double check before we do anything that that actually did what we wanted it to. So under textures, I should see, ah, all my textures. The only other thing that I want is my paint mask. So you remember that layer we turned off? This one? Well, I'm gonna go to its mask, right click on it, and I'm going to export the mask. Export mask to clipboard or export mask to file. I'm going to do it to file. And I'm going to go put this in the same place. So project TT33 textures. And I'm going to name it TT333 underscore mask. And I'll save that. Now I do need to uh, correct something here with the naming. Uh, you can see that the mask has the right name. But everything else is called TT33 underscore TT33. That's because that's the mesh name. There's all my textures. That's because it's the mesh name followed by the material name. So I'm just going to remove the mesh name so that it has the right naming, TT33. Like so. And I'm going to rename the Occlusion Roughness Metallic to... A for ambient occlusion, R for roughness, and M for metallic. And there. There are now my textures ready to go. So that's it. I can now take this substance file and say file, save as, put it inside that, uh, inside that folder, TT33. I would probably put it in the textures. And I'll save it as TT33. And that's it. That is the whole kit and caboodle in terms of painting this guy. And we now have textures that are ready to go. And again, we've got our really lovely mask that we made that's going to allow us to put the paint on this in the engine. So we'll be able to swap paint jobs by using this as a true or false for where you want the paint to go. That's it. That is the whole kit and caboodle. We're now ready to go with this inside of the engine and make it work. Now, again, you can do a lot more uh, with this texture wise. You know, I just did a fairly simple. Uh, pass on this guy in terms of adding some metal and some wood and some plastic and things like that. Pay attention to what your uh, your chosen weapon is made out of so that you can add the appropriate amount of uh, likeness to it. You don't have to go steel parkerized. Absolutely. You know, you can make a chrome version of your, of your weapon if you like. Uh, you can have it completely painted black if you want. Because I'm adding paint on top of it, though, that's why I'm adding it as a parkerized version of this. Um, and then that's going to be it. That's going to be our, our beginning stuff. Yep, we're going to do the whole paint thing in the engine. What we're going to do is we're going to, essentially, we're going to make a true or false that is going to say, if true, add this paint job um, over top of it using this mask to choose where the paint goes. It's a really, really, really simple thing to show, to set up, which I'll, I'll, I'll teach you guys. We'll do that when we get to the engine part. That's going to be in the... Uh, that's going to be in the next chunk of the assignment. Yep, we're going to create a... Well, the shader we create is going to be not so simple, um, but it'll be, it'll be easy to do. 